atoned by the blood of lamb I'm not a slave to what once held me damned How beautiful that cleansing flood I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow Hey Deep Water, Happy New Year! For you who's watching with us online right now, thanks for being here as we start the service together. 
uh, giving our praise to God through our songs, and then soon receiving God's word through the sermon Pastor AJ has prepared for us. So participate in whatever way is best for you. Invite someone over wherever you are, uh, outdoors or in your living room, or feel free to add into the comments down below as we are scattered but united together and worshiping God to begin a love to be able to pray for us and that we would be made new that the ways that God wants to be able to help us fall more in love with him and his world would just become so evident in today's message. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the new year that you have given us. This reminder that you truly do make new things in our lives, uh, that our circumstances change, but God, most importantly, that we can change because of your unchanging love. So God, I pray that you would just allow us to listen to your truth, that we would be um, brought into a, a revelation today and everything that you have for us. Let us be able to rejoice and praise you now with everything that we have. Amen. I was done. I was lost. I was asleep at the wheel, I was drifting off My heart was failing Yeah, my heart was failing In the dark, heard a song It was the sweetest sound that I've ever heard And my soul went sailing Yeah, my soul went sailing I'm waking up Waking up, I can feel my heart beating and breath in my lungs Like a shock wave burning inside of my chest I should have been gone, I could have been dead I'm waking up, I'm waking up I can feel my heart beating and breath in my lungs I'm on fire, finally free I am alive in the land of the living
Good morning, Deep Water. Uh, a little over a year ago, we were planning out uh, what was going to be kind of the next several sermon series we were going to do, and, and I'd really kind of felt like God had laid the book of 1 Corinthians on my heart, and so I brought that to the table as we were kind of discussing and, and planning, and, and as we thought through it and prayed through it together, we just felt like maybe the time isn't quite right yet uh, for this. And so we just kind of filed it away and, and let it sit there. And again, that was well over a year ago. Now, back in November, I went away on a, a kind of a spiritual retreat to take some time to pray and prepare my heart to return to my role here uh, at Deepwater. And during one of the mornings that I was there, I just felt like God said to me, hey, now's the time for that series in, in 1 Corinthians. So that's, that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take the next few uh, months, probably, and, and take a nice, deliberate, some might even say slow, but deliberate walk through the, the book of 1 Corinthians. Odds are, even if you haven't spent very much time in or around church, if you weren't raised uh, as a Christian or whatever else, you're familiar with at least one part of this book, uh, and that would be chapter 13. It's usually referred to as the love chapter. It's that one that gets read at like 80% of weddings, uh, where Paul says, love is patient, love is kind. Uh, it probably sounds familiar to you at least a little bit. But the thing with chapter 13 is it's kind of a weird chapter. I don't mean it's weird in and of itself, but in terms of how it, it sounds in the context of the rest of the book, it, it reminds me of that thing that happens, I don't know, it happens to me, maybe it doesn't happen to you, but where you'll hear a song and you'll go like, oh man, this is a great song, I'm going to love this band. And you go home and you like download the album and it turns out there's no other song on the album like that. That's sort of how uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is. It's this kind of different feel. Now it fits really well into the book once you understand the whole context, and, and it, it really helps us to understand what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is talking about once we understand the broader context of the book. Uh, but, but it's kind of uh, seems out of place next to the, the verses that talk about things like what you eat and, and not sleeping with your stepmom uh, and, and uh, how you celebrate the Lord's Supper and, and all these kind of really nitty-gritty things, all kinds of stuff about like sexual immorality issues and, and not getting hammered at church. Uh, it it kind of sticks out there. But we're going to work our way through all of it. And, and uh, I believe that, that both because of this kind of specific uh, leading from the Holy Spirit and, and just because of a, a deep faith in the, the aliveness and the powerfulness uh, of Scripture, that God's got some really cool stuff He wants to say to us uh, and do in us as we study through the book of 1 Corinthians. So we're just going to kick that off uh, together this morning. We're going to get our, our bearings about what this thing is, this thing we call 1 Corinthians, what's going on, what's happening, uh, look a little bit about uh, kind of what's the key idea that, that we'll be tracing through the book, uh, and, and we're just going to dive in. But first, let's pray. Father, Thank you that you spoke uh, to the church in Corinth uh, so many years ago. And thank you that through what you spoke to them, you still want to speak to us, change us, transform us, help us. And so, Father, uh, right here today, week one, we open our hearts up to you, and we invite you to come uh, and to, to speak to our, our minds, to work in our hearts, to transform our lives through the truth of your word and the power of your spirit. Amen. Amen. So, 1 Corinthians, uh, let's read this first little bit, and then we'll dive in and break down kind of some of what's going on here. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 10, we're actually going to read. If you have a Bible that divides stuff up into sections, you'll notice 9 is the end of a section, and 10 is just the first part of another larger section, but we want to read that one uh, this morning as well because it's uh, important to set up sort of the overall theme of the book. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle, and to Christ Jesus, and from our brother Sosthenes. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to whom uh, you have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he's given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way, with all your eloquent words and with all your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. 
Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this, for he is faithful to do what he says. And he has invited you into partnership with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. So 1 Corinthians was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, in some places in Acts, he's referred to as Saul. Uh, so if you're reading, again, particularly in the book of Acts, and you see some guy named Saul, that's Paul, same guy. Contrary to popular belief, uh, Paul is not his name now because God changed his name when he brought him to himself. Uh, it's actually, Saul is the Hebrew kind of version, Hebrew uh, spelling, pronunciation idea of his name. Paul is the Greek. And, and so it's sort of like, my name is AJ, but if I'm talking to someone French, they might call me Aji. That's not that they've changed my name. They're just saying it the French way. So Saul is kind of the Hebrew way. Paul is the, the Greek form of that same name. And, and Paul was a fellow who had persecuted the church until God got a hold of him and then sent him out. Uh, that's what an apostle is. It's someone who's been sent on a mission uh, it, he, till God sent him out to share the good news, especially uh, the good news of Jesus, especially with non-Jewish folks, a.k.a. Gentiles. In kind of the, the Jewish uh, view of the world, particularly at that time, there's basically two categories of people, Jewish people and not Jewish people, uh, Jewish people and Gentiles. And so uh, the apostle Peter was, was seen as the, the apostle, the kind of primary one sent to share the good news with the Jews. Paul was seen as the, the primary apostle, the primary one sent to share the good news of Jesus with the Gentiles. So it's written by the apostle Paul to the church that's in the city of Corinth. Corinth was located about 80 kilometers west of Athens, uh, and Corinth was a, a very old city. It had been around for a long time by the time Paul's writing. Uh, in Greece's golden age, uh, Corinth had been uh, known for being like the most sexually immoral, the most sexually promiscuous city in the world. The, the Greek playwright uh, Aristophanes, when he needed kind of a blanket term to describe uh, se sexual immorality, he would say it was to Corinthianize. Uh, he, like literally their name became synonymous with sexual immorality. The geographer Strabo claimed that uh, the temple of Aphrodite, which was in Corinth, uh, at one time had over a thousand sacred prostitutes working there. Now, the Roman Empire, when they came in and conquered the Greeks, they destroyed uh, the city in 146 BC, but then they kind of refounded it and rebuilt it in 44 BC. And so uh, this Greek city, deeply known for incredible immorality, destroyed, rebuilt by the Romans. It was a port city. Uh, it had about 80,000 people who lived in the city proper and then roughly 20,000 in kind of the outlying areas. Uh, it was very important when it came to trade and the transpor uh, transportation of goods. And while there's uh, no clear evidence that Roman Greece uh, had the same levels of sexual immorality that, uh, or sorry, Roman Corinth had the same levels of sexual immorality that Greek Corinth did. Uh, there's certainly also no reason to believe it wasn't as, at least as uh, rough and sexually immoral as any other port town at the time, uh, and that was not saying much. They were pretty rough places to be. Paul refers to the church in Corinth. He says, I'm writing this to the church in Corinth, which is not insignificant because in some of his writings, he'll actually refer to the churches. Uh, in the book of Galatians, for example, it's to the churches in Galatia. And this uh, implies, kind of gives us the idea that he's talking about one specific local gathering, like one group that met in one home. Uh, when Paul uses the plural, usually he's talking about multiple of these gatherings, what we might call a local congregation or a local church. And so he's writing this to not just a church or the churches, but the church in Corinth, implying that this is probably just one group that meets together for worship in someone's home. Now, this would likely be someone wealthy who had a large home, but uh, even taking that into account, we're talking a church of probably less than 50 people uh, in what is for that day a pretty big town. And so he's writing to this one small church. And now I said that's his audience as opposed to his readers. His audience is the church in Corinth. Uh, because we often will refer to Corinthians and other uh, 
chunks of the Bible as books of the Bible, right? The book of, the book of Corinthians, the book of Matthew, the book of Galatians, the book of Ephesians. The more technical term for, for what 1 Corinthians is, is an epistle, which is a, a kind of letter. It's a form of a letter. But it's maybe even more helpful for us to think of it as a speech delivered by proxy, a speech delivered by proxy. Paul couldn't go to address them. And so he writes this letter and sends it with someone. Uh, seems like it's quite possible it was this fellow he mentioned, Sosthenes, uh, who was mentioned in Acts 18, 17, another guy named Sosthenes, reasonable to assume they're the same person, but we don't know that for sure, who had actually been a leader in the local synagogue there in Corinth. And so someone who uh, was had experience leading a community and addressing public and that kind of thing. And so Paul would send the letter with someone. There's no post office. Somebody has to take it and deliver it. And they would get up. Most folks were uh, unable to read. And initially, there was only the one copy of the letter. Now, over time, they would copy it and distribute it. And that's part of how it makes it into the canon of Scripture. But initially, there's one dude with one copy of this letter. And he would get everyone together, uh, all 50-ish of them, and stand and read it kind of as though he's Paul delivering it. So you can kind of think of it as a speech or a sermon uh, or like a kind of public address by proxy. So another interesting question is when did Paul write this? Like wh- wh- where did this book come in, in terms of time? Well, we know uh, that Paul wrote this book while he was in prison in Ephesus. Uh, If you half recognize that word, Ephesians, that's the church in Ephesus. So he's been imprisoned in Ephesus, and that's where he's writing this book from. And we know that he was in prison between 52 and 55 AD. So, hey, bada boom, bada bing, that's when this book was written, somewhere between 52 and 55 AD. One of the many things that happened over this last year of 2020 uh, was uh, the Comedian Adam Sandler released this tribute song to his friend Chris Farley, who'd passed away several years ago. This is not an endorsement. I'm not saying to check it out or whatever else, but uh, if you were a fan of Chris Farley back in the day, uh, you may find it kind of touching. I'll admit I, uh, I choked up a little bit when I watched it. it was, it's this kind of touching musical tribute to his friend Chris Farley. Nobody at least anywhere that I saw. I mean, it got lots of media coverage. It was kind of a thing. Nobody that I saw stepped up and said, man, that was so long ago. How, how would Adam Sandler even remember what Chris Farley was like? How could he even remember the things he'd done? It was so long ago. And if he had, if he had misrepresented anything about who Chris Farley was, what Chris Farley did, how he was like, there would have been a ton of people who would have stood up and said, hey, 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 hey. That's not who he was. That's not how he's like, because there's so many people who are still alive who were alive when Chris Farley died. Chris Farley died at the age of 33 in 1997. That's about 23, 24 years ago. Christ Jesus died and rose again at the age of 33 in AD 30, about 24 years before this letter was written. Paul is not writing about some long lost historical figure back in the the mists of time. He, he's not writing to a world where nobody really remembers him or, or knows what he actually was like or what he actually said. If Paul had been off on what he was saying, on how he was describing Jesus and what Jesus had done and what it, what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, there would have been so many people still alive who had walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, uh, learned from Jesus, heard Jesus speak, saw Jesus die, that they would have called him on it. In fact, not only those who'd walked with him and talked with him and heard him teach and, and saw him die, but 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Paul himself says this. Uh, he's talking about after Jesus has, has been resurrected from the dead and he appears to the disciples and they see him and he says, after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time most of whom are still alive, though some have died. So even Paul himself is going, look, there's a ton of people who can witness to this, who can testify to that. My point being, it was written after Jesus had died and resurrected, a while later, but not really that long. I mean, if you look back, that's about the equivalent of 1996. That's the year I graduated from high school. 1996, if you want to have a sense of how long ago 24-ish years is, That's the year that the Nintendo 64 was released. Uh, That's the year that that 
uh, Prince Charles and Princess Diana got divorced. That's the year that eBay launched. Uh, that's the year that uh, Los Del Rio had us all dance in the Macarena, right? That's the, the year that Alanis Morissette angered grammarians everywhere with her song, Ironic. That's the year that Oasis said that, after all, we were their wonder wall. That's the, the year that Gwen Stefani, with no doubt, was letting us know that she's just a girl. Uh, that was the year that Celine Dion was everything she was because I loved her. I don't think she was actually talking to me, but that's the point. You'll notice if you look through the, the, the big musical kind of hits of 1996, there's nothing by Nirvana there. Do you know why? Because Kurt Cobain had already been dead for two years. The, the death and resurrection of Jesus to the writing of this letter is more recent than the death of Kurt Cobain is to us today. Now, you ask anyone who is old enough to have been aware of what was going on in the world when Kurt Cobain died, they'll be able to tell you, yeah, I remember that. I know who that guy is. I'm, I'm familiar with him. I'm aware of him. I know his music, that kind of thing. Again, it's been a while since Jesus had died and resurrected, but not that long. It's a relatively recent event when Paul is writing this. I think it's so important for us to have that in mind. There's so many people who want to say, oh, scripture, like hundreds of years later, some guys wrote some things down and we don't really know. No, 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 no. Even the books that were written the furthest after Christ were still within the lifetime of people who had seen him, talked to him, known him, followed him, seen him, resurrected. So last question we want to wrestle with, why did Paul write this? What's he getting at here? What's he, what's he trying to say? What's the purpose for this? Uh, the epistles that Paul writes, they're not just kind of random. I had some thoughts and I figured I'd write them down and then I ought to send them to someone. There's always a reason, a, a purpose behind it. In fact, you'll see uh, in this book as we work through it, it's, there's a correspondence that's going on here. Paul will often start a, a section by saying, in regards to your question about, or, or to respond to what you were asking about, or to address this rumor that I've heard about you guys, he, there's a dialogue, there's a back and forth. This is a, a, a concrete moment in time where Paul is addressing this specific church. He's not just going, hey, you guys are good people, let me give you some of my thoughts. He's addressing specific issues in the church. So there's a reason, there's a purpose behind it. The fact that he's writing this stuff to this church at this time is not coincidence. We call this book 1 Corinthians, but actually uh, scholars seem to see evidence in Scripture that, that Paul probably wrote four letters to the church in Corinth. We only have two of them, but the one we call 1 Corinthians is likely the second letter that he sent. And so uh, don't, we're not going to try to call this 2 Corinthians and then the other one 4 Corinthians or whatever else. We're going to stick with 1 and 2 Corinthians. But I just want to drive that home. This is a dialogue that's happened, so it's got a really clear purpose. And when you first look through the book, if you just take an initial read-through, which I encourage you to do, it won't take you that long. You can do it in a sitting if you really want to. You can easily do it over the course of a couple of days. At first, it just seems like a laundry list of places where this church is messing up and they need to, to get it together. Uh, in fact, that's part of why we're calling this series Get It Together. Because Paul's going, guys, you got to stop this. You got to knock off this. You got to start doing this. You got to get it together on this, again, kind of broad laundry list of things. They need to get it together when it comes to sexual morality, when it comes to spiritual gifts and speaking in tongues, when it, when it comes to how they should conduct their, their worship gatherings together, how they should celebrate the Lord's Supper, how they should settle legal disputes and what they eat. I mean, on and on. It's this list of things where they need to get it together. But when we start to look a little deeper, when we start to dig down even further, we see that these issues are ultimately symptoms of disunity, of a lack of unity, of a lack of togetherness within this particular body, within this particular congregation, within this particular community of followers of Jesus. There's a lack of unity that stems from a lack of love for each other. And so Paul is calling them to unity, right? That's where he says, let there be no divisions in the church, live in harmony together. He's saying you need to get it together, it being like the church itself. You guys as a community need to get together. You need to love each other and be united with each other. We are living in a time of incredible division in the world right now. I don't remember a time in my life, at least, where there's been so much division, so much mistrust, so much us versus them, uh, so much of that kind of choosing sides and taking factions and, and, and seeing other people as the enemy. And maybe that's part 
of why God is calling us as a church to take some time and look through this book right now. In a world that's so divided, there's all the more need for us as a church to lean in to the unity that God makes possible for us. So as we dive into this series, I want to invite you uh, just to open your heart to the Holy Spirit, to, to open your heart to the, the teaching, correcting, convicting work of the Holy Spirit in, in two main areas. I'm going to lead us in a prayer that's going to focus on these two main things, kind of inviting God to speak to us in these two main areas. The first thing we're going to ask is, is God, are there areas of my life where I need to get it together in terms of how I'm living? Are there areas of my life where I need to get it together in terms of how I'm living? Does, does 2021 need to be the year where I finally get this thing sorted, get this part of my life on track, get this habit broken or this habit established, or where I need to get it together in terms of, of how I'm living? Are there issues of sin I need to address or, or ways I'm, I'm being a poor stu- uh, steward of my time or my talent or my, my resources that, that I need to step it up? Are there, there are places where how I'm worshiping or, or serving or, or praying need to change, need to grow, need to move forward, where I need to get it together. Places where you're calling me uh, and where I need to get it together to be more of who it is you want me to be and who it is that, that by your spirit you're empowering me to be. And so are there areas of my life where I need to get it together in terms of how I'm living? And then are there areas of my life where I need to get it together in terms of how I'm loving? In terms of how I'm loving, specifically, how I'm loving my brothers and sisters in Christ. We should love our neighbor as ourselves. We should love everyone. We should love the stranger. We should love the foreigner. We should love our you know, enemies. We should love everyone. But this book specifically is calling us to love each other within the body of Christ, to love each other within the community of Christ followers. And so it's not just, you know, can I say that I love some stranger down the road, but, but are there ways you're calling me to love other followers of Jesus more than I do right now. Maybe there are specific individuals that, that I need to forgive or mend a relationship with. Maybe there's a, a specific denomination or theological stream or, or even a, a local church maybe that I used to be a part of that I grew up in or whatever that hurt me. And I need to figure out a way to forgive them and, and love them again to have some sense of real true unity with them. Maybe I just need to give up my kind of lone ranger to, which is, uh, to each his own, though none go with me, still I will follow kind of approach to Christianity and dive deep into real authentic community with fellow believers. Are there areas in my life where I need to get it together in terms of how I'm living? And are there areas where I need to get it together in terms of how I'm loving? If that's something you're willing to, maybe there's something in your heart right now and God's going like, yes, you need to, and you're going, oh, okay, I'll say it. Maybe you're going, I think I'm doing fine in those areas, but you just want to say, hey, God, this is gut check time. This is, this is examination time. This is 24-point uh, inspection time. Look me over, like, like uh, David talks about, right? Uh, try me and know my thoughts. Look at my heart, and if there's anything in me that's messed up, point it out and lead me in the better way, the, the way everlasting. So I just want us to pray together, and if, if you're willing to open yourself up to God at the beginning of this new year, the beginning of this new study through 1 Corinthians, uh, I want you to just kind of pray this along with me. Dear God, we invite you to speak to us, to examine our hearts, to challenge us, to convict us, to empower us, and to transform us. If there are places where we need to get it together in terms of how we're living, God, show us. If there are places where we need to get it together in terms of how we're loving, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, if there's hatchets that need to be uh, buried, if there are uh, hurts that need to be overcome, if there's forgiveness that needs to be offered, if there's just pride or arrogance on our part and we need to be humbled, God, show that to us, and then by the power of your Spirit, enable us to get it together so that we can love the way you love. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Ashamed of what I've done 
what I've become. These hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You plead my cause. You write my wrongs. You break my chains.
king who conquered the grave and worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave and worthy is the lamb who was slain and worthy Thanks so much for joining us this morning. It was great to have you with us. It's great to be back. I'm so excited uh, to be back in my role here at Deepwater and uh, looking forward as we continue to move through this series in 1 Corinthians together. I'm super jazzed for it. I just want to remind you of a few quick things before we sign off. Thursday Night Live is back this Thursday night, uh, January 7th at 7 p.m., Uh, I'm going to be preaching again. I would love to see as many of you as is legally possible uh, here. It's all socially distanced and proper and masks and all that kind of thing. But uh, we need you to register in advance to make sure we don't wind up with too many people. And so there'll be a link uh, in the comments below, I believe, or you can uh, respond in the loop. There's definitely going to be a a link there so that you can register. I want to let you know if this is one of your first times ever worshiping with us and you want to know more about who we are, what we do, how to get involved, uh, there'll also be a link showing up in the comments momentarily uh, that you can click on, which will sign you up for our weekly email newsletter called The Loop. That's where kind of all the information, all announcements, anything you might need to know is always there, including how to register uh, for Thursday Night Live this week and every other uh, week. I also want to thank those of you who've continued to be faithful to give uh, of, your, of your finances to support the work of the church and to worship God in that way. And uh, if you want to do that, start doing that, continue doing that. Uh, again, I believe there'll be a link down below for all the different ways you can do that. You can do uh, online options. There's an app option. Uh, you can set up uh, automatic withdrawal, all that kind of stuff. And also, if you just want a good old-fashioned like check or cash, drop it off. Uh, 5756 North Street, that's where our building is. Uh, the mail slot is an offering box right now, and you can just uh, drop a check or money order or uh, gold bullion as long as it fits through the slot in there and uh, we'll put that to good work helping more and more people learn about Jesus and uh, now I want to pronounce a benediction for you for this whole new year may the Lord bless you and protect you may the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you may the Lord show you his favor and grant you his peace amen <laughs>